Uh, that's a lot, Miles. Uh, everyone, thanks for coming back from lunch. Uh, so yeah, we talked about NLP with CNTK and Spark. Uh, and it might not be a good practice to advertise someone else's talk before your talk, but uh, there's a current talk happening right now by uh, Rupe and Sudarshan, who uh, are in Microsoft as well. And they're the primary minds and team behind uh, some of the things we'll talk about today. So if you really want to know a lot about the nitty-gritty details about uh, CNTK and Spark in this package called ML Spark, uh, I won't be offended if you go there instead. I will cover this package a little bit today, uh, but they'll do a full walkthrough of everything in the package. Uh, I'll do one ex couple examples of it and talk about CNTK uh, from a low-level um, uh, talk and then do a kind of weird example. Okay, um, with that being said, this is a really cool package. It allows you to embed uh, CNTK's deep learning algorithms directly inside of Spark pipelines, so directly in Spark SQL and Spark ML pipelines, you can call on CNTK transformers and estimators, and we'll see how to do that today. Uh, we have a booth downstairs that's actually running uh, this on a HT Insight Hadoop Spark cluster. So if you want to take a look uh, and run some examples, you can come down and we have to show you around. Um, so what is CNTK? Uh, CNTK is our deep learning toolkit, so it's the it stands for the Microsoft Cognitive Toolkit. Uh, it's an open source cross-platform deep learning framework, uh, which we've optimized on multiple GPUs, multiple servers, uh, typically for deep learning. Um, so we have everything that we work on in, in this package available on GitHub, uh, Microsoft forward slash CNTK. Um, everything we do for the package happens on GitHub, so that's why you can see 600 branches, because we do a lot of development, a lot of different teams working on it. Uh, so feel free to check it out and see if it's uh, something you, you like. Um, we just last week uh, released a version of CTK 2.0 that we think is ready for production. So if you really want to test out deep learning in your production pipelines, uh, give CTK a, tr a chance. Uh, we have a Java API, which is how we run all the Spark bindings and Spark applications. But we also released a CTK uh, backend for Keras. So if you already have some Keras examples uh, for TensorFlow or for, Tor or for Piano, uh, you can try to replace that with CNTK and see how that works. Uh, and I was really pleased to see just uh, this morning, so this is from, I think, 6 a.m. today, so it's probably sometime last night, uh, the pull request to actually merge in the CNTK backend for Keras got approved, so it's now officially there. There's no additional installs or anything to worry about. So uh, it's officially in Keras now. Okay, so CNTK is a production-ready uh, deep learning toolkit that we've optimized uh, and uh, we think it's you know, really, really efficient and gives you state-of-the-art accuracy. So here's a benchmark done by a couple researchers in the Hong Kong University comparing CNTK to a couple other deep learning frameworks. And uh, as you can see, CNTK does uh, really well on all of these different architectures. So here are some vision architectures as well as some uh, NLP architectures. And yeah, especially for, um, for FCNs and for LSTM models, we do really, really well. So if you have some natural language tasks you want to analyze, with deep learning uh, applications, you can try it out with CNTK, so it should do very well. Uh, so how can you get started? Uh, fortunately, it's uh, pretty easy now to get started. Uh, so we have a pip wheel that you can install directly. So pip install and then the wheel. So for example, this is the 2.0 wheel for Python 3.5 with GPU, um, but all the wheels are listed in the documentation site. Uh, for using Keras, we have a documentation on how to use CNTK with Keras, so you can uh, take a look at that. And we have a full readme on the documentation for the Python APIs as well. So hopefully we've made it as easy to get uh, up and going as quickly as possible. So uh, let us know if anything is, is missing or, or not there. Okay, so uh, let me do a quick overview of the CNTK's API so you can understand what it looks like and how it might differ from other things you've seen before. So most of CNTK is composed into a three-layered uh, pipeline, so we have readers, then we have the definition of the network, and then something that learns the network. So the readers are also really easy, nothing to really initialize or describe, uh, just point it to your data and describe whether or not it's a training set or not, and it'll automatically do you know, randomization if you wanted to, and uh, you know, a lot of cool applications directly. Define network, uh, we try to define networks as computational graphs, so uh, everything in the CNTK network, we define the source structure, uh, the nodes are the functions that you want to, or the uh, operation that you're estimating, and the edges are the values being passed through the network. And then uh, because we have this sort of DAG uh, computational graph, 
We can compute you know, uh, gradient flow through back propagation pretty quickly and easily, and uh, it's a clonable and reusable architecture. Okay, um, sorry. So, you know, because we have this computational graph framework, it's really easy to express complicated structures pretty quickly and efficiently. Um, for us, once we have our uh, training samples, we can pass them through the, the graph and calculate all the gradients and do the optimization pretty efficiently. Uh, defining CNTK networks in the low level API is actually pretty simple and efficient, so it's not a really difficult process. I'll show you the high level APIs in a second. But for example, if you want to estimate a two uh, hidden layer free forward neural network, uh, the low level API is just defining uh, your expressions. So here we're saying we're feeding uh, the inputs into a sigmoid operation and then feeding those second sigmoid and then finally calculating the softmax. Uh, and then the cross entropy is just the, the last optimization step, right? The cross entropy relative to the softmax. So that's, that's a low level API, nothing to really initialize or describe there, no need to describe types or anything really low level, it's just uh, primitives that are pretty easy to, to, to look at. Um, and they come directly from the, the computational graph, so just what you have uh, so express in your pipeline, you can do it directly here. Uh, we also have a high level API that makes it a bit easier to construct more complicated or nested structures, especially if you're doing it with recurrent neural networks. So in this case, we have the uh, layers API where you just say here, I want to do a activation of a sigmoid and the output of that hidden layer is gonna call H1, pass it into, new, into a new uh, hidden layer, call it H2, and then finally calculate the softmax probabilities. Um, so this is the high level sequence, layers API rather, and it's uh, you know, hopefully more intuitive than doing things directly in the level API. Uh, here are the different building blocks in the level API, so for different uh, activation functions, different uh, layers, uh, how, to, how to even do compositions of uh, layers together. And we have an operator that I like to feed forward the previous layer to new layer, so it looks like a pipeline framework um, and different um, uh, gradient uh, optimizers over that. So here's how it looks in the pipeline operation. So the same thing we've done before, the two uh, layered uh, feed forward neural network. So we have our model framework here, and you can see we use that uh, two care sign for the pipeline operator. So we're saying feed in the activations from this sigma unit to the next sigma unit, and then calculate the softmax scores. So uh, some of you guys saw the R talk yesterday, I'm a big fan of the pipe operator in R because it makes things really expressive how you think about doing a computation. Uh, same thing is kind of coming here in the layers API. So rather than define this really weird nested structure and trying to understand the nested hierarchy of it, you just sort of do a, um, a pipeline operation. Okay, and then finally, you just define what kind of uh, optimization algorithm you want to use on it. So just doing SGD, you could use you know, different optimization algorithms with momentum or so on and so forth, and then define a trainer for it. Okay, um, the one thing I do want to do is show you guys, uh, I have to move the browser over, so give me a second. Uh, okay. There we go. And so in the, uh, stop there, okay, so I mentioned that we have a uh, release ML Spark package, which I think is something that should be exciting to a lot of you guys here. So it's just on, it's already on GitHub. It's an MIT license, everything's open source, so hopefully it's easy to, to run through everything. Um, ML Spark is a API that allows you to combine CNTK functions and modules directly in your Spark pipelines. Uh, so you can use it with Spark SQL and Spark ML pipelines as you would any sort of Spark uh, package. Um, we made it really easy to install and use uh, ML Spark. So there's a Docker image for it, so you can go ahead and run this on any sort of Docker container that you like. There's also a Spark package, so if you want to run this in, um, uh, run this somewhere else, for example, in Databricks, we have a Maven repository that you can submit it to uh, for HD Insight, which I'll be doing in a second. You can use Script Action and it'll automatically install the, the library and uh, the kernel for it to use in Jupyter. Uh, you can also build it with SBT, and you can build it from source, right? So hopefully we've covered a lot of different bases for you guys to get up and going very quickly and easily. Uh, no need for you to configure anything. Please give it a try. Uh, come today to the, the booth downstairs, and we will have a demo running for you. But if you have Databricks Cloud uh, instance running, you can run it in there. If you have 
your own um, local solution will try it on. You're going to try it, try it there as well. Uh, let me show you how to run this in the HD Insight platform. So for HD Insight, we're going to create a cluster, a Spark cluster 2.1, and we're going to run the script action, and that will automatically install everything for you. Uh, fortunately, that's pretty easy. So let me quickly get that. Thanks. So it's going to make a new cluster. I'll say uh, I want to do an HD Insight cluster that's under data analytics workloads. So I'll say HD Insight. And uh, let's give it a quick name. And then here I get to pick the subscription that I want to charge it to, so whichever team I want to spend money on today. And then I'll pick the cluster type will be Spark. So yesterday I talked about R server on Spark, so that was the R server option. So this is just a regular Spark cluster. So it's a Spark. Uh, we run it on 2.1 and uh, running Java 8. All right, so select that quickly. And really the only thing that you have to configure is the script action. The script action is just one bash script that will run on every single worker node as, as well as the head, the head nodes. And that will allow you to uh, have everything up and running quickly and easily. So let's click on Next. And it should be up and running within five to 10 minutes. This the only thing I want to show you is how to script action. So in the bottom, it says the advanced settings that you can configure to make your cluster a different configuration than what is by default. So for that, I'll say run the script action. Uh, so submit a new script action. There's some default ones already there for you. For example, if you want to install a hue, uh, it's hard to see the left side of the screen. Custom, yes. ML Spark and then just run the script action. In our case, it's on the head nodes and the worker nodes. We don't need it on Zookeeper nodes. Let those four guys be as they are. Um, and now let's click validation to make sure it's actually a script and not some weird jumbo file. And let's click on next. And then press OK. Now I think about five, 10 minutes and it should be ready for us to use. Um, fortunately, I have one ready for us already. So I'll just give you a quick demonstration of that, but uh, make sure you guys give it a try on your own. I'm we're really curious to see how this works for you and your current workloads. So yeah, so we have uh, the Docker image in Microsoft forward slash ML Spark. On HD Insight, you set it up how I just did using the script action that's provided on the GitHub repo. Uh, for Databricks, we had the Maven library, so you just add a new Maven source for that. Uh, if you want to do it locally, you can do it through SBT by building from the Maven source or just running the source from the repository. So hopefully we made it as easy as possible to get started. All right. Now let me show you why it might be worthwhile to even uh, use in the first place. So when you get that HD Insight cluster and you get your mouse on the right screen, there we go. Uh, all the Spark clusters on HD Insight come with uh, two different notebook providers. They come with Jupyter Notebooks and they come with uh, Zeppelin Notebooks. Uh, in the Jupyter Notebooks, you always get these two directories, one for PySpark examples, even the PySpark kernel, one for even the regular Scala kernel with Spark examples. But then when you do a script action, you also get these notebooks that are in the GitHub repo on how to use ML Spark. And there's six, there's six different examples here that we can take a quick look at. Um, again, we have all notebooks running downstairs, so definitely come downstairs, take a more in-depth look at it, ask us questions. All the brilliant engineers working on this package are there, so they'll give you all their insights. But I'll show you a couple of them quickly so you can maybe understand why we were to look at it in the first place. All right. So we'll do a quick comparison here of how you might do a, uh, a classification task using the Spark ML uh, pipelines and then adding in ML Spark. And hopefully you compare the, the patient and see that it's pretty easy to embed this directly into your existing Spark ML pipeline workflow but also hopefully should be much, much more concise and easy to use. Uh, fortunately, we put all the data that you need for your notebooks in a public container, so it's all self-contained. So you don't have to download anything, configure anything, just run the notebooks directly. So we create a quick Spark session um, using a PySpark uh, kernel. Uh, we're gonna load this data, and uh, hopefully you guys see that in a second. Uh, here's how we would do the feature engineering and the actual development using PySpark. So 
Okay, our data already there. Uh, hopefully, you'll see it in a second. But say we want to calculate some additional numeric uh, variables from this data set. So we use some UDFs from PySpark uh, SQL. Uh, we're just going to calculate the average length of words in uh, each of these lines, as well as the total, total, sorry, the average count of words in these two lines and their length. All right, so add that UDF uh, in there. Okay. So in uh, in PySpark, we can tokenize all the all the words. So here here's the new two two variable columns. We can tokenize the words uh, using hashing transform, and then we have to uh, embed that into a assembler, and then select the variables we want. Okay, and now if you want to do say half parameters optimization. Uh, we do have the opportunity to add, to say, a, log a logistic classifier with some penalty terms. We can do binary classification, specify the metrics you want to use, and then do a, an evaluator. All right, so let's, I should go through this. So we have to specify the split that we want to try it on, uh, the parameters we're going to use for our hyperparameters, and then we're going to keep two lists where we'll save all the values uh, from this, from the different uh, values of hyperparameters. Okay, so that's not too bad, but it's actually quite a bit more concise in NML Spark. So we have a function that does automatic um, hyperparameter search for you. We tell you what metric you want and the good advice you want to try it on, and it will go ahead and calculate them for you directly. So from about 25 lines of code down to just about 10 lines of code. And the nice thing about it is that it's embedded directly in your Spark SQL and Spark ML pipelines. It's not a different session, not a different environment. So you can you know, cross and use different uh, functions from either packages, use them to whatever uh, strategy you want to use in that. Okay, uh, hopefully that was at least informative about how the, pi the API looks like. Uh, let me just do two more so we can see how they're used for, that was just one example of doing classification. I try to do s some more in-depth engineering of, of features. So let me make sure I'm not lying to you guys, I actually do want to run everything and I should get back reasonable answers. Okay, I'll come back to that so we can see the results from both. All right, so similarly, we're gonna do a different example here. Here we'll do a uh, TFIDF to generate a couple of sparse features. Um, and actually, I'll just go ahead and run everything so it's easy to see. All right, and then we're gonna remove the stop words uh, and then set the frequency we want to, to contain, to keep, uh, specify uh, the data that we're gonna use for our classification task. And now, just as before, we can train multiple classifiers all at once. And um, here we're using the train classifier module from the ML Spark API. And then evaluating the best model, again, just doing a quick, a quick find best model operation from the ML Spark package. So all the data transformations we did uh, above here can be a mix and match of Spark SQL, Spark ML transformers, and ML Spark. So just one more package in your toolkit and hopefully makes it pretty easy and intuitive. Okay. Um, okay. I thought I should duplicate it so it's a hard to see this direction. Okay, um, so one more example, and then I'll get to the last piece. Uh, we're again gonna take a look at the data sets, uh, create a training test and validation split. Uh, but initially what we're gonna do is we can use the uh, ML pipelines API and do our tokenization, do word to vec to get our embedding matrices and de uh, develop our pipeline API. So we have our tokenization, we have our embedding matrices and we're gonna fit uh, different models. Uh, so we have our different training sets, test sets and validation sets. Uh, now using the ML Spark uh, train classifier algorithm, we can uh, try a different set of algorithms all at once. So we'll do some Anaforest, some GBMs, 
as well as some elastic net models. And uh, again, just specifying the, the parameters, the type parameters you want to search over, the different models you want to use, and combine them all into one big list. And then we can do, uh, again, just pick out the best uh, model from these, this list using the find best model operation. Okay. So you can see, again, that here's the uh, different operations of them. Uh, in each case, you can pretty easily iterate over multiple different hyperparameter values, do your search, and calculate the best AUC values. All right, so uh, please try it out. You know, this came out today officially on GitHub, uh, open sourced through MIT licensed, available on Docker, available on Databricks Cloud, and available locally. So there should be nothing stopping you from trying it out, whatever you want to try it out at. Okay. Um, So getting towards the end, try to get through so I can still have some time for questions. But I want to show you one very quirky example of what you can do with CNTK and uh, recurrent neural networks. So uh, there's a really cool data set available online. Maybe some of you guys have already seen it. It's a GH torrent data set uh, created by Giorgio from Technical University in Delft. Uh, it's available as MySQL dumps or retrievals uh, as a MongoDB uh, database. It's also available on ADLS. So ADLS is our data lake storage system. There's a GitHub repo that will show you how to create a ADLS account and set this up. But um, the basic data structure is uh, everything on GitHub plus uh, the history of GitHub, so it's pretty cool. So here's a chart from the data set. You can see on the x-axis we have the GitHub lines being changed. This is actually a real-time chart available on the website. Uh, and on the y-axis you have the Stack Overflow tags for that language. So there's one kind of weird red dot at the top left. So that means uh, there's a language that's being asked a lot of questions about, a lot of tags like overflow, but it's not much happening on GitHub. Do you have a guess what language that might be? SQL. <laughs> All right, yeah, so a lot of discussions and questions about SQL, but uh, not a whole lot of changes happening in the code base. Uh, and here's just a historical look at all data on GitHub. So there's too many JavaScript libraries out there, but all of them are on this repo. Okay. Um, so here's the data set, what it actually looks like. Uh, it's, it's actually a really cool way of storing all data from GitHub. It gets live events, it has a, uh, a, a message queue that keeps track of all the events. Uh, and then it stores that historical database as well as adds the new events to, to the database as well. Uh, we'll look at just one portion of the data set today. We can look at uh, commits and pull requests, right? So from each user, I want to get their commits. So I'm going to do a, a, a left merge on commits and bring all user information on that user and then merge that into pull requests. So I'll get, for every GitHub pull request, what commits were put in that pull request, as well as message with that pull request. So if they had any sort of message saying, hey, I added this function, or I changed this error, we'll get a message as well. Okay, so what can we do with that? Well, we can, uh, we now have two pretty cool uh, sort of text fields that we can look at. We have, um, we have the natural language associated with pull request. That's all the messages and the discussion happening with that pull request. And then we have the code difference, the code patch that went to that pull request. So we'll just use some uh, glove embeddings to calculate an embedding for the natural language stuff. And then we'll do some tokenization on the pull request data, so on the patch itself. And then I'm going to do a sequence to sequence model. So I'm going to try to convert those code patches into natural language expressions. All right, so sequence to sequence models are the most popular models now for uh, translation. And what we're kind of doing is translation between two really quirky languages. One is natural language and one is programming languages. Uh, so our corpus is going to be a tuple of the code patch and the natural language associated with that code patch, the messages that went into that GitHub uh, pull request. Uh, and then we're going to try to calculate the score. And the score is going to be maximizing the occurrence of the next word given the previous word. All right, so uh, basically it's an encoder-decoder model in a very weird sense. We have a code patch, so here's an example of what a code patch might be. We're going to trim that using the LSTM model on the tokenizations of that code patch with some attention so that we have a very long sequence, we can still keep that. And then we're going to decode that into a natural language expression. So there's also another LSTM model, and we're going to do a natural language decoding of it. All right, and because this could be a very, very long code patch, in order to keep track of you know, the entire history of this, we have a attention mechanism built into it. That's kind of crazy. I mean, this works really well for natural language, especially for languages that have some semantic similarity, but it's actually surprising how well this actually worked for GitHub data. 
So you know, for now we kind of have is automatic uh, message parser for GitHub patches. So if you submit some code to GitHub, it'll automatically say here's a message that might be associated with that GitHub patch. Uh, here's the units that get activated for it. So for example, uh, here's one little patch where someone added a function and it, it, it looks at the different units of that uh, that tokenization and which units got activated. Uh, so obviously the add and del will be there very frequently, so it should get matched pretty well. But for example, in this case, someone added a function to do row sums, and it sees even the axis that was being added across, right? So rather than doing column sums or row sums, it kind of got, kind of got that interpretation. Uh, the really cool thing about this, I think, is we had a differentiable model to go from code to natural language. So we can kind of reverse that. We can ask the opposite question. Like, if I give you a natural language expression, what's the most likely code for that? So now we have a way of the information retrieval. We can actually look back to, the, uh, to our history of data and try to find the most uh, obvious uh, natural, uh, most obvious code expression for that natural language statement. So it's pretty cool, I think. Um, it was very surprising to me how well this worked. Um, so check it out. I'll have that on my GitHub as a repo, so you can walk through it on CNTK. Uh, my repo is there. And feel free to email me if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you, Ali. Uh, if any of you guys have questions for Ali, please come up to one of the two handheld mics. Uh, and ask away. Just super quick, can you show that GitHub, uh, that tab again? Because I couldn't tell. Which tab? The tab go. with the ML Spark? Uh, whichever one that shows all of this work, we want to look at it. All right, thanks. Yeah, so I'll put the slides up as well so you guys have access to everything. But the repository for CNTK on Spark is github.com forward slash Azure and then forward slash MML Spark. MML is just an abbreviation for Microsoft Machine Learning and Spark. So basically, the CNTK uh, API for Spark. So this is for the CNTK API and Spark. And then do also check out the CNTK package itself, so github.com forward slash Microsoft forward slash CNTK. Um, and again, my slides, I tried to curate all the most important links for you guys. So it will have the link to where you can download the pip wheels, or just you know, copy the pip wheels to install CNTK as well as um, the link to the Keras API as well. So that's really cool. This came out just six days ago, less than a week ago. I got merged in today, so it's really hot off the press. But if you guys have existing Keras uh, examples that work on Tiana or TensorFlow, it could be fun to see you know, how will it perform on CNTK. And we want to hear your feedback. And the cool thing about Keras, I think, is that it's you know, portable and transferable. So you want to really add to the community of different use cases with deep learning using a high-level API like Keras. So you can pick whatever is most efficient for you. And do come to our booth downstairs. We have it running there, so you can try it out for yourselves in a more reasonable pace, I think. <laughs> hey, Ali. Uh, the question is related to uh, this CTK is in uh, both Scala and um, and in Python? Yeah, so we have the primary API, the Python API, but we just added last week the Java API as well. And the Java API includes so Scala so, bindings, yeah. so you can try that out. That's how it works actually in ML Spark. And the code's all here, so uh, you know, take a look at even the source and see how we've added the, the libraries and everything for, for Spark. But yeah, you can do it directly in Spark if you want to do Python. So are there, are there any extra steps to take advantage? I, I think you had four nodes on that cluster. Yeah. So are there any extra steps needed to take advantage of those, or how does that work? No, so everything, um, extra steps in terms of configuration, no. Fortunately, everything is part of the, Sp the Spark application. So we'll automatically get the attributed nature of your Spark application. I didn't actually open up the executors, but you can see that the work happens not just locally on one node, but across your Spark application. Um, so definitely try it out. There's, this was on four nodes. It all sort of worked in a Docker image on one machine, so you didn't need four nodes. That's the default settings. But there is, uh, come downstairs to our booth, there's a really big example of running on 300 nodes. So if you want to know about all the nitty degree details to make it work on that scale, it'd be fun to ask the engineers that worked on that. Cool. But please give it a try and let us know how it works. Uh, awesome. If there are no more questions, then let's give uh, Ali one final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.